Hello and welcome to Treasure in Every Verse. I'm your host, author and Bible teacher, Kevin Madison. Thank you for joining us today. Okay, friends, we're getting right back into our study of the foundations. And we're in the, the section called, the last section called Determine. And the last time we were here, internet connection took, <laughs> we went away. So we were right in the middle of revealing how God demonstrates his love. And I was giving you an example of several things, right? One is uh, sowing and reaping. This is what is in effect today. This is the law of God. So it doesn't make a difference whether you're a believer or an unbeliever. You are going to sow what you reap, or reap what you sow. That's the way it is, friends. If you tell a lie, that lie is going to be found out and it's coming back. All right? It's not karma. It's this, sowing and reaping. God don't need karma. God has declarations. He has declared that certain things are going to take place when other things take place. That's what he put into place to do what? Keep down evil. Keep down evil. That's nothing to do with simply punishing people. No, friend. You know, if this wasn't in effect, if people were allowed to just go run around pillaging stealing from other people without any repercussion. Do you recognize the chaos and anarchy that would be present in this world? If we were free to go just beat people up and have no consequences behind doing that, do you, do you recognize what kind of world do you want to live in a world like that? I don't. Where people can go Murder and nothing, no consequences. Their conscience is free and they know for a fact that they are free and nothing will happen to them if they just go kill somebody. You want to live in a world like that? I don't. So God has set boundaries. On the consequences of our actions. He determined those things. So if you believe you can pray that away, good luck. That's all I can tell you. Because it's not going to happen. You are going to reap what you sow. And here's the very unfortunate part. You and I are going to be impacted on the consequences of others sins. The consequences never go away. When you start looking on the, the consequences of sins and they start piling on top of each other, sins and more sins and more sins and consequences after consequences after consequences, what do you get? you get a lot of crazy stuff happening. A lot of people hiding in the shadows, doing things they shouldn't be doing. You get kids missing, being sold into slavery, used as, as whatever these wicked people do with these children, without a conscience. And they go home with their own kids and pretend like everything is okay. What wicked, wicked people we are. But God, on the other hand, He, the God of all creation, He demonstrates, He determined to show His love. God did that. How did He do it? He explained it right here. This isn't the only place he explained it. Probably the greatest of 
all the chapters in the book is Isaiah chapter 53, where God demonstrates his love. For when we were still, who's the we? Paul is including himself. This is essentially all sins, but he's specifically talking about those who will ultimately believe, but it is all sins. We are all without strength. Can I ask you a question? Without strength to do what? To come to God. You and I have no strength within ourselves to come to God. You say, Kevin, but I, I, I believed. No, you didn't. No, you didn't. When did you believe? That's the question you should really answer. When did you believe? I'll show you when you believe. Based on the, the, the Bible, the scriptures. And I can show you from the Old Testament and the New Testament. Don't make a difference which, which uh, testament I go to. But it's easier to show people in the New Testament because they're familiar with it. Here's when you believe. And don't get this backwards, okay? This is when you believe according to the scriptures. And you, that's you, he, who, God, did something. What did God do? God made you alive. Who did that? Your prayer? No, man, any prayer in the world can give people life. God forced himself on you. He had no choice because you wouldn't come any other way. Why not? Because you didn't want to. You loved your sins that much that you would utterly refuse forever to come to God. And I'm going to show you that when we get back to the new birth. God made you alive. When did God do that? Did he wait until after you and I prayed? No, he did that when we were dead. When we were dead. And you were dead in trespasses and sins. So when did God make you alive? Before. And just in case you get it twisted, this is how you were living because of your trespasses and sins. He said, you walk in according to the course of this world. Of what? This world. What's the course of this world? Decay, futility, destruction, wicked, evil. And who is the prince of this world? The prince of the power of the air? that spirit who works in the sons of disobedience. That's what you and I were. So you mean to tell me you had the devil working inside of you and the devil led you to pray to God? Get out of here, man. No way. You are his captive, you are his slave. There's no way in the world you're gonna tell me the devil influenced you to go pray to God. Among whom all of us once conducted ourselves. How? How? What did that conduct? Here's your conduct. What did that conduct look like? It looked like lust. And it was fleshly lust. Was it the spirit of God's lust? No. Was it lust for God? No. That's what your conduct looked like. He didn't finish. Hold up. What did that lead to? It lead to you wanting to fulfill the desires of God. No, that's not what the book teach. 
the book teach that it led to you wanting to fulfill your own fantasies. How were you fulfilling them? In your flesh? Where did it come from? The fantasies of your own mind. God's mind? No, not God's mind. Your mind. Would that lead you to Christ in the gospel? No. That's lead you to acting just like the rest of the world. And you were by what? By nature. You see that right there? You are a child of wrath. Why? Because you were born that way. How did you get there? You got there through birth. How can you change it? You have to change the nature. You can't change the conduct. Why? Because you can't change it. You love your own sins. And you are captive by this guy right here. So don't come telling me, based on your opinion and your thoughts, that you came to God. Get out of here, man. Nobody's coming to God. God has to force himself on you. And just in case you got that backwards, he comes right back and basically says the same thing. But God, because of your fallen nature, he is rich in mercy. Because of his great love, in which he loved us. You did not love God. When, here's that time word again, we were dead. You see that? God did this when we were dead. Dead people have no capacity to love God. Dead people have no capacity to seek God. Dead in trespasses, in sins. He did something. What did he do? He made, he forced himself upon us and made us alive. How did he do that? He did it with Christ. Now, did your prayer do that? No. God said he did it. And he did it with Christ. By grace you've been saved. He not only did that, he raised you up together and made us. You know, please stop walking over words like this. God made you. God made you. He forced you. You say, oh, God, don't force. Get out of here. If he didn't, you would never come. He made us sit together. Where is the believer, the true believer, the one that's born again? Is he here on the earth? No. He is already in accordance with the scriptures. Where is he? He's born from above. If you're still sitting here on the earth, then you are not a believer. Because every single believer is sitting together in heavenly places where? Inside of Jesus Christ. That's where you have to be. In Christ. That, and here's the purpose that in the ages to come, what's the ages to come? The tribulation, that's the one that's coming next. Then you have the millennium, that's the one that's coming after that. And then you have eternity. There's three more ages to come according to the scriptures. So that's what he's talking about. That in the ages to come, he, God, is going to show off that he showed exceeding riches of his grace in his own kindness toward us, the believers. How did he do that? Because he found something in us? No, he did it because you and I were in Christ. Where's all the focus and where's all the attention? It's on the person who made you alive. It's on the person 
who made you sit in heavenly places. It's on this person right here, the in Christ, the in Christ. There's nothing there about you outside of you or dead in trespasses and sins. It said nothing about you praying, but you're saved. Why? Because God has rich mercy, because God has great love, because he had decided and determined to show you that great love. See that? that that's pretty simple, friends. This is simple. This is the biblical gospel. I don't know what people are out there preaching and I really don't care. Outside of it makes me really, really angry because they're diluting Christ and putting the focus on humans as if humans can make a determination on whether they're going to go to heaven or not. That's just God, just some puppet out there saying, anybody who wants to come, come. I'm going to accept you as you are. Friend, this is how you are, dead. If you show up like that in heaven, God's going to cast you into hell. Why? Because he just told you up here that the dead people, by nature, are children of his wrath. So if you show up in heaven, Dead in your trespasses, what are you going to receive from God? Love? No, you're going to receive wrath. That's what the book teach. So God is demonstrating his love. How did he do that? By making something. By making something. Do you see it? It's all God and not you. Who's going to get the praise? Who's going to get the glory? God is. Why? Because it's his love. Because it's all him. Look at what he says. He calls you to do that so that he can show off his own grace and his own kindness. To show that he might reveal to others during the millennium. That he may reveal to others during eternity. Listen, during eternity. Let me help you understand what God is doing right here. Okay, so there's three ages to come. So you have the tribulation. And the church will not be here, by the way. He's going to save some people during the tribulation, a lot of people. Then you have the millennium. This is the thousand year period, right? When Jesus Christ physically come and live on the earth. So God is going to use us to be witnesses as well as Israel. This tribulation is all about Israel coming back to God in Christ, preparing Israel for his return. This is Christ ruling over the whole entire universe, the physical universe that is, being present. And there are gonna be normal, natural people like you and I today, flesh and blood, who's gonna be born here. And they're gonna be born with the same sin nature, the same sin nature that you and I have. There's a difference though. They're gonna be able to see Christ in his glorified state. And they're gonna see God, Christ, face to face. Everybody, according to Isaiah, is gonna to have to come up and pass through Jerusalem three times a year, especially the men. But everybody's gonna to have to come and show themselves. The world is gonna be perfect. Perfect in the sense that God is here. There won't be any carnivorous animals. You won't have to worry about mosquitoes. You won't have to worry about you know, alligators killing you if you go in crocodiles and, and lions and tigers and bears and all this stuff, right? 
because there won't be any of that stuff. Everything in every person, every animal, even the, every, in the whole environment, friends. You're talking about some climate change? <laughs> this is true climate change because there won't be any storms. There won't be none of that mess. According to the Bible, go read the book of Isaiah. It's all over there. As a matter of fact, it's in a lot of those Old Testament saints. Micah and all of those, go read those Old Testament prophets. The, the, the description of the millennium is everywhere in there. Now, what am I saying? They're going to be unbelievers. Everybody is going to be born an unbeliever. Born an unbeliever with the same sin nature. Will they be sinning? Of course they're going to be sinning. But God said that he's going to rule with what he calls a rod of iron. Dependent on the sin, you will get the death penalty immediately. Immediately, Christ will kill you. He said, that's horrible. No, friend. If they did that today, you would cut the murder rate down so fast, it'll blow your mind. Anyhow... <laughs> Anyhow, they, they're going to have to be born again in the millennium, just like you and I are born again. The devil's going to be locked up. So it's going to be all on them. The demons are going to be locked up. Remember in Revelation uh, 19 and 20, God cast the, the, the devil and the demons. He put all of them in the bottomless pit. I know I'm speaking and some of you wondering what in the world is Kevin talking about? Let me, I'm going to go there, just a quick reference, and then i am got to come right back to where we are. So you guys won't think I'm talking fantasy. For those that don't know, and for those that do know, forgive me, because some, some of these people uh, that watch it, I get all these questions, so I lose some people sometimes, so let me, let me do this. And then, this is Revelation chapter 20. Then I saw, chapter 19 is Jesus coming back, taking rain. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having a key to the bottomless pit. To the bottomless pit. See, that's real? Yes, it is real. Where is it? The bottomless pit is somewhere over here. It is underneath the earth. Where? And there's a, a, a cat on it somewhere. Somewhere in the Middle East, around the Euphrates River. See, how do you know that? Because the Old Testament prophets talk about it. So... He's going to have a chain. So this right here is the bottomless pit. That's what that is. All right. And he's going to have a chain in his hand. Now this chain isn't some ordinary chain. So don't think about it as some ordinary chain. Why? Wow, look at what he does with it. He grabs hold of the dragon. Who's that? The serpent of old, the one in Genesis chapter 3. Who is that? His name is called the devil. We also know him as Satan. So here's an angel who's grabbing Satan, all right? And he bonds him. Bonds him? Yeah, bonds Satan, right? What does he do with Satan? He bonds him for a thousand years. So how long is the millennium? The millennium is a thousand years. So God is tying Satan up for a thousand years and all the demons with him. And does what with him? This angel cast this he is this angel. This him is the devil. So this angel cast Satan where? Into the bottomless pit. So where is Satan during the millennium period? The Bible says that he is cast into the bottomless pit. Well, why in the world would God do that? There's, there's 10 ages. God is going through a progression of how he interact with people during each one of these ages. Each one of these ages are a test. Each age is a test. The first nine in, the, in judgment. Okay? I don't have time to get into details about this, folks. I will one day, I showed you the little, the, uh, the age chart. I'm going to do a series called A Story of the Ages, 
where I get into the deep explanation of all the ages and what God is doing. So what, are, what is God doing with all the ages? God is revealing himself and he's removing the very possibility that sin can ever happen again. All right, so, and what does he do? He shut him up. What do you mean shut him up? He stops him from doing what he's doing. What is he doing? He's deceiving the nations. He's a liar. So shutting him up keeps him from doing what? Lying. Lying to who? Lying to me and lying to you that God isn't good. He sets a seal on him. Now, why is God setting a seal on Satan? For the same reason that Pilate allowed the Pharisees to set a seal on the tomb of, of, uh, of Jesus. The seal is the seal of God. No one can break the seal of God, meaning that Satan can't come out. The angel couldn't seal him. He needed the seal of God. So that he should do what? He shut him up. He cannot deceive anymore. Who? The nations. People. God is going to take away his influence over people. Doing what? Doing a thousand years. But when it's finished, but after these, after what? After the thousand years is finished. Things after these things, after the thousand years is finished, he, who's the he, this is Satan, must be released for a little while. You say, why in the world would God do that? I don't have time to explain it. I just want to show it to you. Now you see that I'm not pulling your leg when I came over here and was explaining this about the the ages. All right, so let's get into this right here. God is showing during the ages to come. Remember the ages to come. What are they? That the tribulation then you have the millennium and then ultimately you have what the Bible calls eternity okay so those are the three ages to come over here everybody's saved over here you have a mix of saved believers and unbelievers over here you have a mix of believers and unbelievers all right so those are the ages to come God is going to use the people that he saved from each one of these ages to be a witness, his witness of what? His exceeding great riches of his grace and his kindness. These people right here are going to be born believers. They're going to be born saved. So they will never experience God's grace. You need sin to experience grace, friend. Do you understand that? The true depth of grace can only be experienced if somebody requires it. Everybody here is going to be perfect. How would someone who's perfect ever experience grace? They won't and they can't. But you and I are going to be there. We can tell them about the grace that God showed to us. So we're going to be God's witness that he in fact do have great grace. We're going to be witnesses that God does have riches and great kindness. And it's all because of Jesus Christ. It has nothing to do with me and you. God then turns around and he explains that. How does that great grace and kindness and love come? For it's by this grace that you've been saved. And it comes through somebody's faith. Whose faith? Not yours. Whose faith? God tells you that that faith 
does not come from you. Listen, this faith for salvation is not yours. That's what the Bible teach. Well, who's faith? It, it, yeah, this faith, not the grace, the grace is God's attribute. The faith for salvation comes from God. Where's that faith coming from? That's the made alive part. That's the made alive. That's the faith. It, the faith, is the gift. Why? Because it's the access into this grace. You have to get into grace. The key to getting into grace, faith is the key. That's what you need. You need the key to get into this grace because the grace is the salvation. You need the key. Who has the key? God has the key. And he gives it to you as a gift. It's the gift of faith. Now, what does the gift, God's gift of faith do? It gives you access into disgrace by making you alive. And now that you are alive, you can see your own sinfulness. And you can see the holiness of God. And you do like Isaiah did. You fall on your face and you start confessing your own sin. And you do like Paul did when he met Christ. Who are you, Lord? You see, that's how it works. God gives us specific examples in the Old Testament with Isaiah and in the New Testament with Paul. Was Paul looking for God? No, he was trying to kill God, man. And he's trying to kill all God's children. It's not of anything we do. Why? Because we would boast about our prayer. We would boast about our, our testimony. We would boast about how we go to church and how we study the Bible and how we preach on TV. I, I, we would boast about all this stuff. God says, none of that mess can get you life. None of that mess can get you the faith that's required for salvation. None of that can get you access to my grace. For we are who? We are his workmanship. We, the believer, is God's workmanship. What does that mean? Have you ever looked that work up, that, that word workmanship up? Look it up, please. In other places, it's called we are God's creation. Created. Created. Can your prayer create anything? No. So how are you going to get in God's grace if it takes somebody to create you? Salvation can only come from God. And he creates you in a very specific place where you must be inside of Jesus Christ. Friend, if you are anywhere else, if you are in your church, if you are in some club, some religious club. Friend, you're in the wrong place. The only people who are saved in God's eyes are those who are inside of Jesus Christ. And how did you get there? God made us sit. Who did that? God made you and I sit in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. God did that. Why? Because you can't. All right.